It's good to be here. Father, I pray your blessing as we study your holy word now, and that you give me the gift of teaching, and then give the folks ears that they can receive the word and pray over it, study it, and make their own decisions. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now turn to Isaiah chapter 14 with me this morning, please. <clears throat> the 14th chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse number 4. <clears throat> Scripture says, That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, How hath the oppressed presser ceased, the golden city ceased. And so now what follows is an, uh, uh, a, a, a message directed toward the king of Babylon. But we get to a certain point in this message when we realize there's got to be more going on here than simply a earthly man. And there certainly is, no question about that. Far more going on than simply uh, an earthly human being because it begins to speak in terms that can only refer to a supernatural being, not just a man. For example, uh, in verse number 9, the scripture says, Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And this reference to the dead is like the reference that I gave you last week from Isaiah, where he talks about, They are dead, they shall not rise. Therefore thou hast visited them and destroyed them. And the dead that it's referring to there in Isaiah uh, are the Nephilim. They are the, the, the progeny of uh, angels and human beings, uh, women, uh, before the flood in Genesis 6. And of course this opens the door to all kinds of uh, weird things in the mind of most people today to think that the spirit world is not simply cut and dried, black and white, simplified, packaged and presented as it is from so many places today. And it's not, believe me. The spirit world is far more versatile or uh, uh, different than the physical world. Remember this, the Bible says the God that we worship is an invisible being. He cannot be seen with a human eye. And he dwells in the light which no man can see, which no man hath seen. And that light, therefore, if you were looking right at it, you couldn't see it. Because that light is the light of Almighty God dwelling within himself where he is as he pleases to dwell. And the only thing you'll ever know of God or anything will ever know of God is as much as he chooses to, re is to, to reveal himself. You can only know God through revelation. The scripture says, plainly, canst thou by searching find out God? You can't. You can't. There is no way possible for you to search and find God. Aren't you so glad that he seeketh you? That he's searching for you. And that, of course, is his nature. But in any event, what we have here now in Isaiah chapter number 14 is an address given about the king of Babylon, but it reaches past him. And lo and behold, what shows up here in the 14th chapter of Isaiah is not only the devil, but the Antichrist. Satan himself, who's called Lucifer, and we'll deal with that in a few minutes, and then the man of sin, Satan incarnate in flesh. And this takes place in Revelation chapter number 13, when Satan incarnates himself in a human being, not just enters in like he did to Judas Iscariot, when it told you plainly in the Bible that Satan entered into Judas. That's one thing. But he incarnated himself, for he is the man of sin, the son of perdition. And if you don't think a spirit being can incarnate itself into a human being, how do you think Christ got here? Think about that. Because a spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, came upon this virgin. And that holy thing which is in you, he said, is of the Holy Ghost. And therefore, the spirit world, God Almighty, incarnated himself in human form 2,000 years ago. The Lord Jesus Christ was God walking in flesh amongst us. Not one of the gods, not a god, but the, 
but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So in Isaiah chapter number 14, I want you to notice that he addresses him in verse 12, said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now you can read commentaries uh, everywhere that say, well, now this is simply a reference to, to the king of Babylon. No way. This is looking far past the king of Babylon, and it's addressing someone uh, in his stead. Now the Bible does this. This is not unique in this passage. For when the Lord Jesus spoke to Peter one time, he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan. He spoke to Satan in Peter. Peter was simply a representative of a spirit world or a spirit being that was speaking through him. Remember this. You don't know the essence of a spirit. have no idea how that they can control, take over a human being. If you are a born-again believer, if you have been born of the Spirit of God, the evil one cannot touch your spirit. Therefore, you cannot be possessed in the classic sense of the word. But your flesh is fair game. And the Bible, Bible talks about the fleshly mind and says that that mind must be renewed. So the flesh is an entirely different situation. And here's the problem. So many people don't understand that the mind is such an intricate thing that you think you have the mind of Christ when all along you've got the mind of the devil. So you've got to be very careful when you're dealing with issues like that. I want you to look at Isaiah 14 and verse number 12. He said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now if you notice this word Lucifer shows up here in a Hebrew Bible. Hebrews, I mean Isaiah chapter number 14 verse 12. This is what they call Paleo-Hebrew. And Paleo-Hebrew is the old form of Hebrew. It's like the Hebrew that they found inscribed on the wall of uh, Hezekiah's tunnel. You know about that. It's in the British Museum. They cut that out, took it up there, and it agrees entirely with the Bible. That's Paleo-Hebrew. They're not the square letters that you see in Hebrew today. How many have seen modern Hebrew? You know what I'm talking about. Those, they're square letters. So what in the world is a Latin word? Because Lucifer is Latin. That's a Latin word. What's a Latin word doing in an English Bible that is a translation of Paleo-Hebrew? <laughs> Well, you see, the Bible gets, the King James Bible especially, gets a lot of criticism for this because you can get some of the new translations and they don't have it, Lucifer. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter number 14 and get some of the new translations and they'll translate Hillel, that's the Hebrew word, as morning star, a bright star, or, or a rising star because that's what the word means. It means a rising star, an luminous body. So the word Lucifer in Latin also means the same thing. The word Lucifer means light bearer. That's what the word in Latin means. So how did it show up in the Bible? Well, in the 4th century A.D., about 400, 405 A.D., the Latin Vulgate, which was a product of Jerome, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, inserted the word and translated the word this is nothing, this is a translation, translated the word that is in the Hebrew in, in, in Isaiah 12 as Lucifer. Is that a wrong translation? No, because in Latin, that's what it means. It means light bearer. But they say it's a great mistake for the King James Bible to have the word Lucifer here because when you get into the occult world or you start looking back into ancient history, you'll find that there are many out there that teach that Lucifer was not bad. Lucifer was good, you see. And so we are maligning the character of Lucifer by including him here in Isaiah chapter number 12. Are you all following me so far? But all you have to do is to take someone like Albert Pike who wrote The Morals and Dogma. Let me say this about Albert Pike. He's a brilliant man. You give the devil his due. Albert Pike was brilliant. He was, a conf he was a general in the Confederate Army. And uh, he had long white hair. And you can get into a lot that Albert Pike's related to. There's a statue of him in Washington, D.C. and all that. And he's the only, it's an amazing thing how you have a Confederate general and a statue of a Confederate general in the nation's capital. You can figure that one out. But he's not up there be representing or because he was a Confederate general. He's, the statue of Pike in Washington, D.C. is there because he is a grand, whatever you call them, of the Masonic Lodge. What do you call them? Something grand. 
whatever, you know. But anyway, here's the point. Read what Pike says about Lucifer. All right? Read what Albert Pike said about Lucifer, and there'll be no doubt left in your mind because this man studied all the religions of the world and synthesized them into his religion, which is the Masonic religion. And he brought all these religions together and picked the points that he wanted out of them, this, that, and created his own religion. And Lucifer is at the very forefront of it. And the reason he, did, the reason he is is because in the mind of Albert Pike, Lucifer is the light giver. And the Masonic Lodge is all about light. And so he's the light bearer, the light giver, and he brought that light uh, into mankind. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible in Isaiah chapter number 14 said, Lucifer, you're going to be brought down to hell, to the pit. And he uses the term Lucifer. And for ages, anytime the word Lucifer shows up around Christians, they don't relate it to Michael or Gabriel and put him on the same plane as them to say, well, he's a good angel. No. Anytime a Christian hears the word Lucifer, they immediately think, that's the devil. Amen. And think about the occult world because they all, well, I've never seen one yet that deviated from this. Every, when you start reading what they have to say, and I'm talking about the Theosophist, and I'm talking about the Rosicrucians, and I'm talking about the whole bunch. When they start talking about Lucifer, it's always in good terms about how good he is and about the great light that he has brought to mankind, and that the Christians have perverted the truth about Lucifer. And so it goes. You also know that birds of a feather flock together. Can two walk together except they be agreed? So when I find the occult world and, and Albert Pike and all the rest of them speak in glowing terms of Lucifer, I say to myself, hold on, we got a problem here. They know who he is, and they really do know who he is. They know who he is. Lucifer is the devil. But now you come along today and you get into these new Bible dictionaries. All right, here we are. Fast forward to 2014. You get into the new Bible dictionaries and lo and behold, what do you find? You find them casting doubt on the translation as it is used here. And they begin to talk about Lucifer in the sense, well, you know, he really hasn't been treated right. And, and his name does mean light bearer. And so what they do is begin to compare him with Christ and in some places make him Christ. And so what they've done is confuse in the minds of the people the bright and morning star and the sun of the morning. Which is which? Which is which? If I said to you, son of the morning, who am I talking about? Oh, huh? <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> no, well, I'm not trying. I'm trying to show you how that they are so closely related. So closely related, the terminology is so close. Is Jesus Christ the bright and morning star? Is Lucifer called the son of the morning? All right. What's the difference in the two? Now, of course, if you want to get deeper, deeper into it, they talk about Venus and all this stuff. We don't want to get into a big, long thing in here this morning. But what I'm trying to do is to show you how that you can confuse the identity. And if you confuse the identity in the minds of the people, then you've done your job because God's not the author of confusion. You see, God's not the author of confusion. So when I hear, when I talk about when I, when I say the bright and morning star, there is no doubt in anybody's mind who we're talking about. And if I talk about the sun of the morning, we know we're talking about Satan because Satan is Lucifer. Now, what I just said right there enrages Wiccans, for example. Wicca. Wicca is supposed to be white magic. Witches are related to black magic. They have all these different categories that they, that they categorize themselves in and, and lay themselves out, but they all have the same thing. They reject the absolute sovereignty and identity and personhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who divides. He's the one who gives light. He's the one who makes all the difference. As I've said 10,000 times, 
You can be wrong on the millennium. You can be wrong on church polity. You can be wrong on eschatology. You can be wrong about a lot of things. But if you're right about Christ, you'll go to heaven. But if you're wrong about Christ, you can be right about all the rest of that junk. But if you're wrong about Christ, you won't go to heaven. So Satan's primary purpose is to confuse the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he? He's God in flesh. He's the only name given among men whereby we must be saved. He is not on the same plane with Lucifer or with Sophia or with, a, or with some demon God. He is God Almighty. He is that invisible being who manifested himself 2,000 years ago, and beside him there is none other. That's the only name whereby we can be saved is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll follow a man as far as he wants to go until he comes to Christ, and then I'll say to him, who is he? And when he tells me who he is, I'll tell you what that man is, and I'll tell you what he believes. It won't take you 30 seconds when he starts telling you who the Lord Jesus Christ is, you'll know what he is. You'll know it immediately. So it's all important. Uh, for example, here's one of the richest men in the world. In a recent Rolling Stone interview, the richest man in the world, of course that deviates according to the stock market, was asked, do you believe in God? He said that he believes science has now filled in some explanations for disease and the weather. But after admitting that science can't explain everything, he shared an intriguing comment about his openness to God. The mystery and the beauty of the world is overwhelmingly amazing, and there's no scientific explanation of how it came about. To say that it was generated by random numbers, that does seem, you know, sort of an, of an uncharitable view. I think it makes sense to believe in God, but exactly what decision in your life you make differently because of it, I don't know. Do you know who said that? Every time you sit down in front of a computer, if it's Windows, you're paying Mr. Gates. He's worth, deviates, at one time he was worth $90 billion, 90,000 million. And right now I think it's something like 50, 60, 70 billion dollars. He is a, he makes millionaires look like paupers, folks. They said uh, that he is so rich that it's not worth his time to bend over and pick up a thousand dollar bill. That's how rich he is. But he doesn't know the Lord. So he's poor, isn't he? And just think about this, when his heart stops beating and he draws his breath, last breath of life, how much of that will he take with him? Not a dime. And if he could take it with him, what good would it do him? You see? How, every time my computer locks up, I, I don't think too highly of Mr. Gates. You believe that. But, uh, and it locked up on me this morning. It, locks, it locked up back there. If you, of course, that was, uh, what's his name? The Apple. <laughs> Uh, there, <laughs> Job, Steve Jobs, yeah. Uh, the, the apples lock up too. But anyway, Lucifer is the son of the morning, all right? He's a spirit being, a spirit being. But now watch carefully. Now look at this. For in verse 13, Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the side, the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And this is one of the reasons that I have said time and again, I do not believe that Satan, Lucifer, has ever laid his eyes on God in his absolute purity. He has only seen as God allows himself to see. His creatures, all of God's creatures, can only know as much of God as God makes himself known to them. That's important to understand because we have the erroneous idea that because they're in the spirit world that they have this great knowledge that we don't have. They have seen things we haven't. They have been places that we have not, but we have experienced things they haven't. I have been born again. None of them ever have. I've got the spirit of God living within my soul. There is a difference there. But the point is this. He said, I will be like, I will be like, I will be like, I will be like. But he had never seen God in his glory as that eternal being that will make himself known to you one day. For I do not believe that any creature, once it lays its eyes on that eternal maker, that eternal being, could ever say, I will be like him. For he is so far above the greatest of his creatures. It's unbelievable at the difference between God and the greatest thing he's ever made. 
the vast separation that takes place between the two. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ came from the light that no man can see, shone into this world, and is the bridge between creation and the Creator. He's the bridge. He's the one who has seen both, both sides. This is why he says, No man knows the Father but the Son, and no man knows the Son but the Father. But now look at this thing in Isaiah 14, verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now watch carefully verse 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Now watch this. Is this the what? The man that maketh the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms. <coughs> What's he mean, man? When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to come back and make war with the beast. Revelation. And when he makes war with the beast, he's going to bring the beast down in the sight of all of those who have worshipped him and followed him. And when he brings him down, he's going to bring him down on the ground, in the dirt, in the face of everyone that has believed him to be a God. And they're going to look on him and they're going to, they're going to look on him with disdain and they're going to say to themselves, you mean to tell me that this right here is the one who shook the world? And when the Lord Jesus Christ stands triumphant with his foot on the neck of his enemies, they will know the vast difference. And men don't know it yet, but they'll know the vast difference between the creator and a creature. And that's what Satan is, folks. He is a creature. And it needs to be, you, folks need to be reminded, as I said a moment ago, there is a gulf between the creator and the creature. And here you're going to find the man of sin brought down in the sight of all the earth with the Lord Jesus Christ with his foot on his neck, defeating him. And then he takes him and he casts him into a lake of fire and brimstone. For a thousand years he'll be there and there he'll scream from the presence of God. Now this just came out. There is scientific evidence to suggest that life can continue after death, according to the largest ever medical study carried out on the subject. A team based in the UK, United Kingdom, has spent the last four years seeking out cardiac arrest patients to analyze their experiences and found that almost 40% of the survivors described having some form of awareness at the time when they were declared clinically dead. Experts currently believe that the uh, brain shuts down within 20 to 30 seconds of the heart stopping beating, and that it is not possible to be aware of anything at all once that has happened. Did you hear that now? The heart stops within 20 to 30 seconds, the brain shuts down, brain shuts down, you're out of it, all right? You can't possibly be aware of anything that's going on. But scientists in the new study said they heard compelling evidence that patients experienced real events for up to three minutes after this had happened and could recall them accurately once they had been resuscitated. And this is the part that makes all the difference in the world. They can say that people have hallucination, drug-induced hallucinations, blah, blah, uh, swooning uh, between death and life and what have you. But once a doctor has pronounced the patient dead, all right, and then for some reason that person comes back, that person many times comes back and tells the people about things that have happened in that room or outside of that room or in an area around there that they could not possibly have known. That's what blows their mind. You can't explain that. There's no way. Scientifically, it cannot be explained other than to say there is an element involved here that's not affected by the heartbeat and by the brain and by, you know, EKGs and the rest of it. There's something going on here that's on a higher plane. And of course, what's happening is the soul and the spirit. Look over here at 2 Corinthians now, and I'll show you in the Bible. Now, I want you to look carefully now what he says, said the apostle in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul. 
Verse 1, is not expedient. Is it not expedient for me, doubtless to glory? I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. See, the word revelation, all the revelations Paul had, it's remarkable at the revelations he had, not only in doctrine, but in the appearance of Christ and his relationship with God. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Now watch what he says. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. Now be awful careful before you condemn all out-of-body experiences as just simply being some hallucination or what have you. Because what the Apostle's talking about here in 2 Corinthians 12 is something that happened to him personally that just doesn't fit. It's hard to explain. And notice what he says. He says, I was caught up into the third heaven. The Bible knows nothing about seven heavens. That's beautiful literature, Dante's Inferno and all this stuff, you know, that's all nice. Shakespeare, I love Shakespeare and all that, that's all grand. But I don't go to them for truth. I go to the Bible. There are three heavens. The air you're breathing, first heaven. Second heaven's what they're looking at with telescopes. Third heaven, you cannot see with the naked eye. That is that door in Revelation chapters number four and five that was opened to John. He entered into the third heaven. The Apostle Paul said, I was caught up into the third heaven. Now, obviously, from what I read from this, his body was not caught up to the third heaven. But the Apostle Paul was nonetheless fully conscious and fully intact as a being and caught up into the third heaven. And then he said he heard things. All right. Now, by hearing these things, he obviously uh, is conscious. He's aware. He can be communicated to. And then he comes back into his body and he's resuscitated. Now, what happened to him? Somebody says, well, now that's a classic out-of-body experience. I would take it as that, but I'd take it in the context of the Bible. All right? In the context of the Scripture, something happened to the Apostle Paul. Now, we most of the time say what happened to him physically on this earth was outside the gates of Lystra in the book of Acts, he was stoned. And every indication we have is he could possibly have been stoned to death outside the gates of Lystra. And it was at that time that the apostle was caught up into the third heaven. Now go with me to the book of 1 Samuel. It's about eight chapter. Uh, where's the witch of Endor? 20, uh, was, uh, 28, 29, 28, uh, here it is, 28. 1 Samuel 28, verse 7, he said, Seek me a woman with a familiar spirit. All right, that familiar spirit is what you get into in seances and when you try to, uh, in necromancy, when you communicate with the dead. That's what's going on, familiar spirits. You say, well, it's just a bunch of garbage. Don't be so quick to say it's garbage. It is a reality. It's a reality that you don't have anything to do with, though. He told him in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 18, leave that stuff alone because you can get in trouble. And so Saul, king of, uh, king of Israel, had banished from his land uh, witches and uh, all these people that communicated with, with, uh, evil, with, dead, with dead people, she had a familiar spirit. He said, I want to go to her and inquire. And what has happened, of course, was a battle was uh, ensuing. Samuel was dead, and he wanted to communicate with the one who had anointed him as the king, and he wanted to communicate with him. Now, I want you to go with me further on over, same chapter. Let's jump over to... Uh, Verse number, uh, verse number 11, 1 Samuel 28, 11. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Now watch this. Now here's where the great controversy comes in. And when the woman saw Samuel. Now some of the commentaries say, Well, this was a mistranslation. That it should have been Saul. 
So apparently she saw the reaction of Saul and what follows is what, uh, what she said is because of what she saw Saul do. Now what does your Bible say? It says Samuel, doesn't it? I'm going to stick with the book. Amen. Now here's one of the reasons though that they, like, they don't like to, they, they hate this. They hate this. It's because of this. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. Here's a dead man coming back to the earth. Think of the implications. <laughs> a dead man. Now, we're not talking about an impersonating familiar spirit. We're talking about Samuel was brought back. Now, I personally believe it's Samuel. I have from day one. I never had any problem believing that. I believe the Bible anyway, but in a sense, I thought, uh, well, maybe this is a familiar, maybe this is an impersonating demon. Like you go to a seance and, and, and you're talking to your dead mother or wife or child or something like that. I hope you don't go to seances. You can get demon possessed in seances. You can, you can come out of there with far more than you went in there bargaining for. Uh, leave that junk alone. But these people, uh, they think they're talking to the dead. They're talking to spirits, a familiar spirit. All right. Remember I told you this is lessons about spirits. Ghost. Seances. Here we have Samuel coming back from the dead. A lot of good conservative commentaries, and I mean good ones, good men, refuse to believe it's Samuel. Now here's why. Why would God let a pagan or a, 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 a cult individual conjure up one of his own prophets? See, that's the question. Now think about that for a minute. That's a legitimate question. They have a legitimate concern. So I'm not being critical of these men. They're good men. I've got their commentaries and I've read what they've had to say. I understand that position. But sometimes the Almighty overrules what the individuals are doing for His own glory. Now one case in point is this. When the king of Judah went up to fight with the king of Israel, a scene opens up in heaven again like it does in the book of Job. Occasionally in the Bible, all of a sudden, the curtains are pulled back and here's this scene in heaven. And what happens is that these spirits are standing before God. All these spirits are standing before them. And the voice comes forth from the throne and said, Who will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets? And one of these spirits says, I'll go. He said, Go. He was sent directly from heaven down here. I think it's Isaiah chapter number 45. I should have written these references down because I've been through so much of this stuff. I get on stuff and forget to, but I believe it's the 45th chapter of Isaiah where it says, I create evil. Now, who said that? Hmm? God did. You say then, is he's the author of evil? Is he the source of evil? No. The word create can be used in a lot of different senses, but in the sense that Evil would not exist if I had not allowed it to enter into the universe. How many of you agree with that? You believe that God could have stopped evil in the very beginning? Certainly you do. If you believe God's sovereign, almighty, nothing can happen outside. But did He create this stuff in the sense that it came forth from Him, that He was the, the author of it? What does it mean in John 8, 44 when the Lord Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. And he was a liar from the beginning and abode not in the truth. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, right? Is Satan a liar? Of course he is. Can he tell the truth? Yes, he can tell the truth. He can mix the truth with error. So the point is that this lying spirit goes forth from the throne of God. Now, if you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and I'm trying to show you a principle. I'm trying to show you the way the mind of God operates. Because they love not the truth, but rejected the truth. For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie and be damned. Right? He that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Folks, when you start reading this stuff, it's mind-boggling at what goes on. It is unbelievable at the stuff that's happening in the world. I read the story about a man that was filleted alive in Haiti. 
filleted, cut strips of his skin off, and he's alive in Haiti. And all of this, of course, was done to their God, to, uh, to uh, uh, well, they call this stuff down there, this voodoo, voodoo, all right? So nothing can happen outside of the will of God. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> he is absolute and he is in absolute control of everything. But he has a reason for this. He has a reason for allowing evil. There's a mind behind it. There's a greater purpose going on than we can understand in our limited experience here on this earth. So when he said, I'll send this lying spirit, he sent the lying spirit. And the lying spirit, of course, you know, is Jehoshaphat and Ahab. You know what happened. And uh, Jeho Jehoshaphat, uh, Ahab had uh, Jehoshaphat cl clad as the, it's been a while since I've read it, but didn't he have him clad as the king of, of Israel? And they started after him, and Jehoshaphat said, no, hold on a minute, I'm not Ahab. And so they turned from him, and one, the Bible says, pulled a, pulled a bow at a venture, and let the arrow fly, and it smote Ahab in his chariot, and when he, and, and he smote him in his chariot, and uh, the chariot took him back, and, and they washed the blood out of the chariot. The dogs licked the blood, didn't they? Same as they did with Jezebel. The dogs licked the blood of Ahab from his chariot. But the bottom line is, the point is that God Almighty is the one who authored that, but why did he do it? Why did he do it? It's like, it's like Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. That's what he said. I will harden his heart. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. But he tells you why in 2 Thessalonians 2. Why? That's exactly right. Same reason Pharaoh was hardened because God told Moses before he hardened his heart. He said, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go. Exactly. Exactly. John chapter number one. Light is coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light. All right. But right before that it said, and this is the condemnation. Look up that word condemnation in your Greek text. Get a lexicon dictionary. And don't just understand the word, what the word condemnation means in English. You need to understand what the word is in Greek and how it's used. And what it means is, this is the way that I am going to judge you. You had light. You rejected light. Because you had light and rejected light, you get darkness. He said in John chapter number 9, he said, you see. And because you say you're see, therefore your sin remaineth. If I had not come and done the works among you that I have done, then it would be a different story entirely. But you have had blazing light shining into your soul, and you've rejected that light. And that is the way that God judges, and the judge of the whole earth will do right. And so where is evil in the world? Why is it here? Evil is in this world because God uses it for His glory, to bring about an end that he intends to bring. That one day we'll all begin to understand the real essence in sin and why all of this started and how God glorifies himself in the end. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary, folks, he paid the sin debt. Paid for all of the sin debt. He paid for every bit of the sin debt. And not only did he pay for it, he literally became sin for us who knew no sin. And that's mind-boggling. That blows my mind. I mean, it's one thing to die for you, which is, bless, praise his holy name. Amen. But then to become sin. And sin, of course, as you define it in Scripture, is a much, much broader thing as simply the act. Sin is also the state Sin is also the motive. Sin is also the being. Sin in all of its essence was taken care of at the cross at Calvary. We'll never understand until we're there what went on on that tree when the Lord Jesus Christ confronted sin and he took it in himself, bless his holy name. So the spirit world is dealing with that. And this act here, when, what happens? Well, carried out of the body. <clears throat> but he came back. Now I'm going to leave this one with you because <clears throat> I, I want you to go out of here thinking. <clears throat> Did Samuel come back? Well, yeah, I didn't bring his body back, no. 
but you're not the body anyway. <laughs> All right? If Samuel came back, what's going on? Really? Well, I, I'll think about that. <laughs> You'll have to think about it, won't you? Right. Diane Kampf, she's a pediatrician. Uh, just get, I can't remember. I've got a couple of her books. D I A N E K O M P K O M M P. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And she's dealt with dying children, for a lot of dying children. Yeah, get her name. You'll get her books. All you got to do is get the name. Oh yeah. Yeah, and she might have even written more than I'm not aware of, but she's a fine Christian lady, and I mean, she came to her faith in Christ because of, just like Maurice Rawlings, when Maurice Rawlings brought this guy back that was on the treadmill, said, I'm screaming, burning in hell, Maurice Rawlings, a cardiologist down here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and when he, he went home and dusted off his Bible and started reading it, and he was born again, the cardiologist was, and the same way with this woman. She started seeing these children die, watching them die, and seeing what that they were saying, and the visions they were having, and all. She couldn't just pass that off, and she got saved. And it'd be amazing, you know, if you could talk to these doctors at the stuff they see, and you know, they're around and they're there, they're in the room, and uh, it'd be amazing. And uh, don't don't kid yourself today, folks. There are many born again doctors in this town, and all over this country, and nurses. When I was in the hospital, I met many nurses that were uh, uh, genuine Christians. No doubt in my mind, they love the Lord. All right, we'll pick it up again next week. We've opened up some stuff for you now. We've got a dead man coming back, and we've got a man leaving his body. I hope that will make you think until we come back. Brother Ronnie Crane, you dismiss him.